Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Of course, the market's been reacting positively to the uh, vaccine news we got from Pfizer earlier this week, but it's overshadowing a worrying spike in coronavirus cases as the nation continues to set new daily case counts here uh, in the U.S. We've heard warnings uh, from President-elect Joe Biden talking about why the next few months mask wearing is going to be rather important. But let's dig into that issue a little bit more here uh, as one new doctor to that new coronavirus task force uh, for President-elect Biden warns that the next few months here could be COVID hell. Uh, Join us now is Dr. Michael uh, Osterholm, University of Minnesota Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Uh, and Dr. Osterholm, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy here trying to parse out this kind of transition phase in terms of handling the pandemic right now. Uh, in terms of that front, what are you seeing uh, play out here? And what are you trying to stress to Americans as you come on board here in this new task force to take over and trying to get this under control? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, in terms of the tr- uh, task force and working with the uh, president-elect and uh, uh, vice president-elect, uh, right now we really don't have a, a, the detailed agenda that's being crafted uh, as we speak. So I would just say that uh, there really is an effort being made to, first of all, be prepared to hit the ground running on January 20th. And number two, in the meantime, even though not in control of the government as such, what can we pull together and share with the states and cities out there that have often been left to their own devices in terms of trying to respond to this uh, pandemic so that, in fact, that that kind of information and support can be there. So you'll you'll be hearing much more, I think, in the very, very uh, near term in terms of what the transition team is working on. On that transition process, Doctor, um, we've heard a lot about um, some of the challenges other departments and agencies are facing right now because the Trump administration isn't necessarily on board with the transition as they look to these legal fights in individual states. From your standpoint, as you try to craft a more comprehensive uh, COVID policy to take effect in January, how big of a hurdle does that create for you? Well, you know, I wouldn't say it's a hurdle yet. Uh, I can't comment on that as a, just as a member of the task force. I know that the leadership of the task force, as well as the staff and the transition team are working on that issue. You know, as, as you know, from listening to people like Tony Fauci and others, you know, we've had, uh, you know, a fair amount of information exchange that already has occurred over the recent months. And that's continuing. Uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of transparency in that piece. Uh, it's just a matter of what the actual uh, points are that will be made a priority. So, so I think at this point that will work out. And we surely, uh, both as task force members and as our just everyday professional uh, uh, careers, we are already communicating with people at HHS on, a, on an extensive basis. And Doctor, as, as one of those new members of the task force, as well as you said, just an expert in kind of getting this under control, I'd be curious to get your take on what you might stress to the task force in terms of changing some of the strategies we've seen fail under the Trump administration. Specifically, I'd point to what's playing out in El Paso right now. They went from three mobile overflow uh, morgues there to four, now 10. Uh, the city, uh, despite having only uh, under 700,000 people there, has more cases, more hospitalized patients than some states. And we've seen uh, you know, officials there grappling, the mayor battling the governor, uh, battling the county judge, and all this. Uh, what are you looking to do differently when it comes to actually implementing some changes to protect Americans? Well, the first thing that has to happen is we have to have a, a story to tell America. We have to be able to explain to them what's happening. You know, this is the virus versus us. This is not the virus versus uh, one group of politicians versus another, one regional area against another, hospitals versus what goes on in the community. This is us versus the virus. You know, I said yesterday that we are entering uh, this period that I call COVID hell. Uh, you know, back on Labor Day, we were at about uh, 23,000 cases of new coronavirus infection every day. Uh, today, we're going to be in the 130s, 140,000 again, and that number is going to keep rising rapidly. And, you know, we've been predicting this It's a combination of pandemic fatigue, people just being tired of trying to, you know, avoid the public and the places that put you at increased risk, pandemic anger, where up to a third of the U.S. population doesn't believe this pandemic is real to begin with. So why adhere to any kind of public health uh, recommendations? And then we just have indoor air. We have a situation where going indoors right now, we know that virus concentrations build up inside 
and transmission is much more there. So we have to tell the story of what's coming. People don't want to hear that El Paso isn't an isolated event. El Paso, in many instances, will become the norm. And, you know, we have healthcare systems right now that are overwhelmed already, right now. And we're talking about potentially doubling the number of cases over this time period before the president-elect even takes office. And so I think that the message is, how do we get through this? We need FDR moments right now. We need fireside chats. We need somebody to tell America, this is what in the hell is going to happen. And this is what we got to do about it in a way that they believe it. They understand it. They feel it. And they see that somebody's trying to lead them. And that can be anybody. But I believe that the, uh, the transition team surely is placing the president-elect in particular to help guide us. And his message has been very clear. So just understand, everyone on this screen will know a COVID-related event, either in yourself or your family or your colleagues in the days ahead. If you haven't had it happen already, it's going to happen. There mm -hmm. won't be any blue or red states anymore. There won't be blue or red counties. It'll be covid color. Doctor, to that point, we've seen a number of states over the last few days move more aggressively in placing restrictions, implementing restrictions. We had Utah with that mask mandate earlier this week. Now we've got these reports suggesting that in New Jersey, schools could close down um, from the end of this month into January. How effective can these policies be state by state in the absence of a federal mandate? You know, they're going to have some limited impact. But let me just come back to a point, because this has been, I think, a very confusing issue, and that is lockdowns. If I interviewed 50 people today in the U.S. for what they define a lockdown as, I could get 75 different answers. And I think that one of the challenges has been that there, there really is an understanding of what a lockdown is all about. We talk about the pain and suffering of the virus, but the pain and suffering to the economy and what it does. You know, I'd refer everyone back to an op-ed piece in early August that Neil Kashkari, the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, and I did in the New York Times. Number one, we predicted what we, where we'd be right now. We, we said this would happen if we did nothing different. Number two is that when you look at the personal savings rate in this country, it's now gone from about 8% to over 22%. We have a big pool of money out there that we could borrow at the historic low interest rates by the federal government. We could pay for a package right now to cover the, all of the wages, lost wages for individual workers, for losses to small companies, to medium sized companies, yeah. for city, states, county governments. We could do all of that. If we did that, then we could lock down for four to six weeks. And if we did that, we could drive the numbers down like they've done in Asia, like they did in New Zealand and Australia. And then we could really watch ourselves cruising into the vaccine availability in the first and second quarter of next year yeah. and bringing back the economy long before that. Well, doctor, I really wanted to quickly ask you before we let you go about the vaccine push here too, because that's going to be key for your task force. And when we look at that, there are uh, increasingly uh, worries that Americans just might not want to get the vaccine. When you think about polling at 50 percent of Americans roughly saying that they wouldn't want to get it. Uh, talk to me about the incentives that the task force is going to have to work with to maybe push Americans to get it out there since we know it's important to getting this pandemic under control. What do you see playing out? Yeah, that's absolutely critical. You know, particularly when you look at the fact that this virus infection has disproportionately impacted the black, uh, indigenous and communities of colors out there. It has. We have to understand that they also have reasons not to trust things like vaccines. Um, so while we all want all Americans to be vaccinated eventually, uh, you know, we're going to have a hard time getting some groups who may be at the highest risk. And so we have a, an urgent need to begin educating the public about these vaccines, uh, what they can do, what they can't do about their safety. Again, telling a story that we need to tell a story. And, you know, we can't go from day to day, from crisis to crisis. How are we going to get to the point of protecting our country and the world? It's going to be getting to vaccines that are safe and effective, and it's going to take a while to get there. So what do we do in the meantime? And that's, I think, what is the immediate issue right now. And, and what I see, I think all of us need to work towards is how do we help Americans? How do we help the world get to a time when we will have adequate supplies of the vaccine and not have to have, you know, thousands and thousands of deaths before that happens? Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but the new member uh, of Biden's task force here, coronavirus task force, uh, challenged with exactly those goals. Dr. Michael uh, Osterholm, appreciate Thank you taking you.